Good afternoon. Welcome to Five on Friday. Uh, this is my second go at it because the technology seemed to be a bit dodgy just before. If someone can give me a bit of a thumbs up and maybe write a comment that you can hear me, that would be great, but it does look a little bit better now. Uh, sorry about the false start. So today's Five on Friday is um, kind of dedicated to the uh, One Girl organisations do it like a do it in a dress uh, campaign, which is their annual um, in October, they have an annual event where they encourage people to do it in a dress and wear a school dress to support the and raise money for the 130 million females who still do not have access to education and schooling. So um, I have got a lot of colleagues at work who are participating in uh, Do It In A Dress this year. Last year we had a great group of people from work do it in a dress and this year we have even more including some of our fabulous um, IT men and they looked gorgeous last year walking across the road to get their daily coffee and this year we're hoping to raise awareness and funds for the Do It In A Dress campaign. So we, the money that we're raising this year is going to support girls' education in Sierra Leone and Uganda. And so for a week I will be doing it in a dress and I'll be wearing this dress um, to work, to everywhere I go. Um, and I do have two evening events on that week so um, I'm going to attempt to wash the <laughs> dress as much as I can um, but stay in the dress as much as I can as well. So I've chosen five books for this afternoon. Uh, which are all about girls, but they are for all readers of any persuasion and gender. They are books about girls, but they are not just for girls. In fact, I feel really strongly that books and stories are just for all and that we need to break down those stereotypes of what is a girl's book and what is a boy's book. And I know that publishers and marketing have a lot to do with um, some of those issues, but I think that it's really important as parents, educators, librarians and just readers that we try to read books um, which are sometimes clearly marketed at one gender or another and in particularly encourage our children to um, just read widely because if more boys were reading books with girls in them, perhaps we wouldn't be having the issues that we do around toxic masculinity. If more girls were reading books with boys in them, perhaps we would understand the other gender just a little bit better. If we were all reading books with diverse characters in them from different walks of life, I just feel like the world would be a much better place. Through books, our young people are able to walk in the shoes of other people and I just think that's so important. Um, I am very aware that um, I live in a bubble. I My entire world is a bubble and um, where I work is another bubble and you know it's really good to get out of your bubble and read outside of your bubble so that you are able to develop, to develop kindness, empathy and compassion for other people from all different walks of life and I just feel like reading books is such a great way to empower young people with information about um, and kindness and compassion and empathy. I feel very strongly that books are for all and every child should be um, able to access books and that every child should be encouraged to develop an identity as a reader regardless of age, gender, reading difficulties or not. Um, I just think it's incredibly important that we raise readers, um, hence the title of my book, Raising Readers. Um, it was really important to me that um, the title reflects what I'm all about, which is raising readers. So I've got five books today about girls, but as I said, they are for all readers. Now the first ones that I'm going to show you are girls are pretty dot 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 and boys will be dot dot dot. Um, I absolutely love these. They're by Susan Hoffman and they're just really empowering and inclusive celebrations of um, gender and of people in all of their diversity and wonderfulness. Now, the first thing I'm gonna say is that when Chickpea read these books, she was like, girls are pretty, that's dumb. And then she looked at the ellipse, is that how you say it? And she was like, oh, that usually means something more is coming. 
And I was like, yep, something more is coming. And and I wasn't even, she just saw these books on my desk downstairs and she picked them up and, and she was a little bit scandalised by the girls, a pretty title, I think, but was happy then with the ellipsis. And then she was like, oh, the kids say, the clothing says creative, bold, brave, clever and fast, which I actually hadn't even noticed. So sometimes it takes a child um, to show us uh, some of the elements of a book that we might miss. Now, it's a lift the flat book and look, I always feel a bit conflicted about a lift the flat book as a teacher librarian because uh, those lift the flaps tend to get ripped off. But um, they're quite strong and sturdy ones and they're nice half page ones. So girls are pretty, funny. Girls are pretty, oh my glory, can you tell I like, haven't practiced this? Brave, girls are pretty, bold. And so it goes on. And look, the language and the sentences are really um, simple, but they're deceptively simple because there's so much to discuss in these books. And I actually think, um, the language is intentionally simple in order to allow discussion between a parent and a child, an educator and a child. Uh, boys will be boys, says things like boys will be loving, boys will be funny, boys will be calm. And you will have already noticed the depictions of diversity throughout both these titles. They're obviously aimed at an early childhood audience and quite frankly that's actually where we need to start this um, I was going to say re-education, but it's not a re-education. We just need to start at a really early age, um, not genderifying everything and not stereotyping what a girl is and what a boy is. Um, you know, oh, don't even get me started. Um, but, you know, if you want to read more about all of that stuff, I'd have to recommend the writing of Clementine Ford. Um, and I know that she's controversial, but her essential message is really important. And I feel like um, these two books are a really good step uh, in the right direction for um, a very young audience. So you could read these books from birth, um, but my, um, how old is she? Oh my gosh, I don't know if she's seven or eight. I don't know, my seven slash eight year old, oh, that's so embarrassing. She really enjoyed them as well, um, so they're fantastic. The next series I'm going to show you is something that I've been waiting for for ages. So all of you, oh my gosh, everybody watching will know about the Rebel Girls series. They came out a few years ago with that fabulous Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls and then number two where they had like I think 100 stories of um, Rebel Girls and they were short one page um, synopsis, I guess, of amazing rebel girls um, all across the world and they were fabulously illustrated, they were beautiful productions, you know, there was nothing not to love about them. I, at the time I thought perfect because that's all we want, we want a snapshot and we just need like this, you know, fast, fast, fast little snips, snippets of information about these women. And I still feel like that. I think that those Rebel Girl books and all of the subsequent copycats um, are really good ones for teachers to have on their desks to quickly read a story in the afternoon when you come in from lunch to calm everybody down or for parents to have on the kitchen table accessible to their children so that they can read a two-minute story about an inspiring woman or man because there's lots of... Um, male versions as well. But like I said, I think it's really important that boys read stories about girls as well. Uh, it's a great one to have on the kitchen table to just read a bit of information, um, you know, as you're eating your breakfast. We often read at the kitchen table because quite frankly, I don't really, I'm not often up to talking first thing in the morning. I need to be handed my coffee, which um, Pusser is quite adept at making if I Google home her upstairs and say, um, Mummy needs her coffee. Um, I love the broadcast function on the Google Home. Um, it usually appears. And, you know, I talk to students all day at school and I know that sounds terrible, but sometimes in the mornings I just need to actually mentally prepare for the day and um, I don't necessarily want to talk to my children. Is that terrible? Should I be actually admitting that on Facebook? I don't know. I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, I digress. So I love the Rebel Girl books. Um, 
and I wouldn't have said we needed these a few years ago. However, I think we've actually come a really long way in the past few years and I actually think our children want more. They want more in-depth stories of amazing rebel women and girls and this series has come, I think, at the right time. I don't know that it would have worked a few years ago but now it's perfect. So I have said, I have post-it notes because I have to these days, otherwise I just waffle. Look at me waffling. Um, I think these are for kind of middle to upper primary to even lower primary. So Chickpea's in grade two and um, she's the one I can't remember how old she is. Um, and she has read the Ada, the Ada Lovelace one um, in the last few days and really enjoyed it. But then my grade six child, I ha she hasn't read them yet, but I know that she will greatly enjoy them as well. So I think they're perhaps timeless. Um, they are, what I'm really interested in is that they are done with different organisations. Rebel Girls as an organisation has partnered with other organisations to put these books together and I think that's really clever. This one is with the I Fund Women um, organisation which is a crowdfunding campaign or crowdfunding organisation for female entrepreneurs. And this one is done with um, Woe Grammar, which is a female programmers organisation. And there's a bit of information at the back of each book about the organi different organisations that Rebel Girls have partnered with. I'm not sure how I feel about the author not being acknowledged on the front cover. So you have to go to the imprint page to find the author. Um, and I guess as a female organisation, I would like to maybe see them. Um, I understand Rebel Girls is the brand, but I think I'd like to see the actual author um, attributed on the front cover, but maybe that's me as a librarian. I just feel really strongly about acknowledging authors and illustrators right up front, but it is on the imprint page and that's great. Um, so they're beautiful publications. They're nice little hardbacks. They're very giftable, as all of the Rebel Girl products are. Their posters are also really beautiful. I have all their posters in my library. They've got great end papers. The Ada Lovelace one um, is quite different to the Madame C.J. Walker one. Very beautiful, lots of um, full colour illustrations throughout. The text is a nice size and I think that the colour um, illustrations probably help some younger readers or reluctant readers to um, stay interested in the stories. There's an afterword in each book and I really liked these. They explained a little bit more about why they were a rebel girl and um, a little bit more about the, um, their life. And then at the end of each one, there is some activities. So for those of you who don't know, um, Ada Lovelace was the first female programmer. Um, she was an astonishing woman. She died at 36, so she certainly did not have a long life, but what she achieved in her life was absolutely remarkable. And yeah, she is credited with being the world's first programmer. I mean, that's just astonishing. It's such an interesting story. She was an absolute mathematician. Um, I've been really interested in her life for a few years now because my teaching partner, um, aka Tinkering Child, um, has always been a massive Ada Lovelace fan. Um, and yeah, so this is the story of her. And in the back there are some activities around um, punch cards, which are machine specific directions. And there's a bit of stuff about coding and binary. Um, and then at the back, there's a little bit about the organisation that Rebel Girls have partnered with, Woe Grammar. Uh, this one is um, Madam C.J. Walker Builds a Business. And it is about, I'm going to read my post note, is that rude? This woman uh, was, her hair care company that she established made her America's first female self-made millionaire, which is astonishing. And it's a really, really interesting and engaging story. I knew absolutely nothing about her. In fact, I must have missed her little um, story in the Rebel Girls um, series because I, I didn't, I, I, I don't remember reading about her. Maybe I skipped her over because I didn't necessarily read the books from cover to cover. But gosh, I found this story interesting. It's really, really well written. It's absolutely fascinating. You can see as well that she is a woman of colour. So she was absolutely revolutionary for her time in which she lived. And again, there is a really good afterword and then there's some activities. And this, um, these activities are really great ones. These ones are thinking about exciting new products and thinking about existing products that you might use as a young person already and how they could be made better. And then um, telling people about your product and creating ads and then coming up with an elevator pitch for your product. 
Um, and then again, there's some information about the organisation, which in this case is the one I spoke about earlier, I Fund Women. So I just feel like this series and everything that Rebel Girls do is about building a world which is inclusive and is celebrating diversity and is celebrating women and entrepreneurs and, you know, just all sorts of women doing fabulous things. So I absolutely love, love, love the series. Hey, RJ Mills, I've just seen that you've popped online. Um, you have got to get for your little person boys will be and girls are pretty I don't know if you saw the start of my video but if you didn't you need to go back and watch it I absolutely love this series and I instantly thought of you when I saw that series okay the next book that I'm going to talk about is um, one it's the seventh book in the through my eyes series this one is called a Hasina a novel and this series is edited by I've forgotten her name Lynn White sorry, Lynn White, um, but they all have different authors and they are all about um, people, well, young children actually, who are living in conflict zones all over the world. They're contemporary conflict zones, which I think is really important for our young people of today to read about and understand. And certainly this one has been one of my favourites, along probably with Shahana by Roseanne Hawke. I absolutely loved that one. And I love the one, I think, by John Heffernan um, set in Japan, who Otaka, um, I think it is, and I absolutely loved that one. I've loved all of them, but a few of them in particular I've really, really engaged with. It's a really tough ask to write an engaging book about a young child living in a contemporary conflict zone, and I would you could not pay me enough money. In fact, authors actually don't earn very much money. So anyway, you could not pay me the measly sum that an author earns to write one of these books because I think it would come with a level of um, a feeling of responsibility. I think it could be quite traumatic. Um, and I think you would want the book to be empowering and like I said earlier, a book that develops empathy, kindness and compassion in children. But I just think the responsibility of writing this series must weigh heavily on the authors who've been involved and I'm sure all of them have not taken the books on lightly. So Michelle, the author of this one, I know that um, she was born in what was then called Burma and is now Myanmar um, and so she was obviously a, a good person to, to write this one and Alan and Unwin have been very specific in the authors they have chosen to write each one. And a post-it note just fell on me. So Michelle is now a teacher at RMIT. I learned today by a um, from a very helpful person on Facebook. Thanks, Michelle. And um, not Michelle, the author. Michelle, a different author. And she's a librarian, teacher librarian. Anyway, I digress. Um, so yeah, uh, Michelle has written a couple of other. Well, she's done a lot of writing. She has another book, but she's written a few essays and so forth as well. But I believe this is her first book for a younger audience. And gosh, the strength of her writing in this one to me just screams: you need to stay in this age group. It is such an engaging story. So it focuses on. Oh my gosh, would you look at my post-it notes? I'm not even going to read all of these. So. It is one child's experience of the refugee crisis in Myanmar. The novel opens with low-flying military helicopters um, and Hasina, the main character, um, has never had this experience before, but her cousin and aunt who are living with her family certainly have. They are displaced peoples and um, they know exactly what is happening. Um, her younger brother, um, calls them, I can't remember, copters or something, but, you know, he just thinks it's a bit exciting. Anyway, so there's these low-flying helicopters and it's quite an entrance. You are instantly transported to Myanmar and that feeling, and perhaps I had it as an adult because I think as an adult you come at books like this with all of um, your adult understanding about some of these horrific conflict situations um, around the world. Perhaps as a child, I think, often children do not carry, um, feel as much trauma as we as adults do reading books like this. But anyway, um, Hassana's family are Rohingya um, and Muslim and um, 
I think a few years ago the UN declared that the Rohingya people were the most persecuted minority group in the world um, and certainly you know um, that would be almost a well-known fact to many of you watching. Um, anyway, uh, Hasana has a really gorgeous family and her aunt and cousin living with her and they live in a beautiful riverside town and there's this beautiful passage which I'm going to read to you which gives such a great, oh, all my post notes are flying off anyway, I don't even know why I bother. There's this beautiful passage which I think gives a really good um, insight into the strength of the author's writing and her ability to transport the young or 43 year old reader into the setting. This is um, in Hasana's kitchen where her mother spends a lot of time. The wooden kitchen is low and dark and sizzling with heat. It smells good. Wood burns in three stone braziers. Cast iron pots bubble on top, one with fish curry, another with rice. On the third, a metal deshi cooking pot cools. The air is tangy with fish, coriander, ginger and turmeric. The sweetness of rice, the sting of onion and the perfume of wood smoke. An earthenware chatty pot full of cool water for drinking sits on a stand in one corner. On the square kitchen table lies a suri, a wide bladed chopping knife. Oranges are piled in a bowl and a bunch of bananas hangs from a cord slung from one side of the kitchen roof to the other. If you want to eat one, all you have to do is jump for it. And then it goes in to talk about um, her father's lunch that Hasina is to deliver to him in um, a Tiffin, um, in Tiffin characters. And it's a sa sweet sour rice cake, rice with some dal and lots of gravy, plus potatoes and green and Kalale brand special spice mix, her mother's secret ingredient. I just feel like it's a really good, um, it transports the reader instantly into that kitchen. And then in the next chapter on, Hasina is walking through the town to deliver her father's lunch and she walks down a street where some of her friends live and again you are Michelle describes the um, sights and the sounds and the smells of food cooking and of gardens growing with produce. So Hassan's life at the start is tense um, in her village there's obviously been a level of tension between Muslims and Buddhist um, people and nationalities um, and there is then a, a scene of violence really where um, military arrive at Hasina's front door and her father Ibrahim just says to Hasina run and take your brother and your cousin and they run into the forest and they hide and the military basically walks in and marches all the Rohingya people out of the village. It is a incredibly distressing scene but completely age appropriate. So this is for upper primary, I'm saying from grade five, six and into lower secondary. Um, and if you are a teacher, there's incredibly extensive teacher's notes on the Through My Eyes website. Um, like the teacher's notes are something like 32 pages per book. They are extraordinary teacher's notes with a great synopsis and great activities linked to the Australian curriculum. The work that has gone into this series blows my mind and I take my hat off to both Alan and Unwin and the series editor Lynn White um, and they've won a number of awards and been shortlisted for a number of awards for this series. It is one of the most empowering series that I have seen in such a long time in helping young readers to um, walk in the shoes of somebody else. Through My Eyes is such a great series title because it it says exactly um, what the series aims to do, transport children who live in a bubble, like I was saying earlier, into the life of somebody who has a life so vastly different from them. All of the children in the series are brave, courageous, but also very vulnerable. And this is um, an extraordinary book. Hasina. Um, eventually comes back from hiding in the forest to find that her village has been burnt down and her family are gone and um, therein, you know, starts this whole other story of Hasina being the, um, the person to take care of who is left in her family for a time and um, 
it's an extraordinary book. Look, on some levels you might be listening thinking, not for my child, um, but you know what? I think that this series is for every child of the right age. Um, so I'm sort of saying nine, ten and up, depending on your child's emotional maturity level. Um, I just think it's so important that we read stories of children who live outside of our bubbles and children who are brave and courageous and do astonishing things in life. Um, I cannot recommend this series more highly. I know a lot of teachers will already know about it because it's this series is used a lot in schools and I always do one of these books every year for my year six um, book club. Um, yeah, it's an astonishing series. They're just brilliant. I shall stop raving. I am raving. Anyway, my next book is a I was going to say similar. It's not similar in that it's certainly not set in a conflict zone, although kind of um, Debbie's family is a little bit of a conflict zone at times. This one is called Nice Girls Don't Play Footy. And this is a fabulous book about Debbie, who is at an elite sporting school. And I'm going to read you what it says here about Debbie. Um, My ultimate goal was to make it to Bollywood and become its first ever Australian, half Indian, sort of Kiwi, water Scottish, Banavi vegan superstar. So she has, she's in a selective high school, which is an elite school for um, sporting future sporting stars, and she is there for her dancing ability, a dancing ability, and her mother runs a Bollywood dance studio, and um, we've got this fabulous grandmother. I think the grandmother was potentially my favourite character. She's fantastic. She's just so damn awful, but so great. Uh, I mean, she's not awful. She's just very opinionated, um, as I... I have come across a few Indian grandmothers in my time and, and you know, I've come across a few grandmothers in my time, including my own. They are forces to be reckoned with, are they not? Anyway, so Devi is at this school for dancing. She, But because it's a sporting school, they're introduced to other sports and the novel opens with her um, being introduced to women's football or football um, and she just like, as she jumps and catches that ball for the very first time, a whole world opens to her and she's just like, oh my gosh, this is my calling. Now she absolutely knows that her family are not going to support her joining a football team um, because they are quite a conservative religious Indian family and that ain't going to happen. So she forges her mother's signature. She joins the school football team. She goes to trainings whilst keeping up all of her Bollywood dance commitments so that she can get into the Bollywood, I think it's Bollywood Oz competition. Um, and her mother is absolutely desperate for her to make it into Bollywood Oz because it's really important for her business, the Bollywood um, dance studio, that her daughter is a shy star in the world of Bollywood. I have always, just to segue slightly, I have always wanted to be a Bollywood star. I bloody love Bollywood movies. I love everything about Bollywood. I love the costumes. I love the humour. I love the music. I love the drama. I love the completely OTT nature of it all. I just think it's brilliant. I am an avid fan of Bollywood movies and Bollywood dancing and put star for her. I think it was her sixth or seventh birthday had a Bollywood party which is on my blog somewhere uh it was like my favorite birthday party to plan ever it's completely about me anyway so it all comes to a head um when you know she can't keep up this secret anymore she's very close to her family they're a beautiful family and she just can't keep up this secret anymore and um, I won't say anymore but it's a really great read for upper primary lower secondary I super duper enjoyed it it's well written I think it might be the author's first book. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And I really, really liked the title, Nice Girls Don't Play 40. I thought it was a great title. And the colours in the cover are very Bollywood. That orange, purple and pink is so very Bollywood. My dog, every five on Friday, my dog's just like, get me in the video. Okay, the last book I'm going to talk to you about is Welcome to My Period. And actually, this one girl, Do It in a Dress campaign, is very much about also providing um, young girls with options for when they have their period because for so many girls in developing countries, they actually don't go to school when they have their period because they don't have access to sanitary products. So I thought I felt like this was a good one to talk about today. Welcome to My Period is written by Yumi Steins and Dr. Melissa Kang. Now, for those of you who don't know, 
Dr. Moisa Kang is actually the Dolly Doctor lady. Now, I wasn't actually allowed to read Dolly magazine as a teen, um, but like I didn't need to have a subscription or buy it from the newsagent with my pocket money because well, I wasn't allowed to and I always did the right thing. Believe it or not, I did. <sighs> anyway, um, I was going to say, you know, it was a misspent youth, but in fact it wasn't. I always towed the line. But uh, I did read my friend's um, copies of Dolly and, of course, like we all did, I always turned to Dolly Doctor first because it is where I found out about everything to do with puberty. Now, so girls today don't have to do this because they have books like this and they have great HRE in their schools. Look how many little notes I've got in this. Um, so I'm also going to tell you that this copy was in my handbag and it got wet, so it's a little bit kind of crazy but that's okay it's going to be well read I love this book because it's got case studies it's got lots of questions from real teens it's got lots of anecdotes and it's got lots and lots of information about your period and puberty um, from a very scientific angle and then from a very personal angle as well where it goes further than other books in this genre is that I feel like it's just very um, child-led or tween-teen-led. I feel like it's got major appeal um, and it deals with things which I think contemporary tweens and teens are really interested in, like period poverty and the environmental impact of san sanitary products and things like, um, you know, an honest discussion about endometriosis, which I myself suffer from, and managing your parents or carers. So, you know, there was a little bit in here about um, dads and how do you talk to your dad about your period and I looked at that chapter heading and I was like oh, you know well my children won't have to face that because their um, father passed away two years ago and I was like oh I don't know if I want them to read that chapter that you know I don't want them I don't, I, I don't know I just always think things about dads might be a bit challenging for them but actually um, this is a chapter about if a child actually just lives with only her dad or you know just as a dad they don't necessarily want to talk to about these things and I have to say as I thought about it I do know a couple of single dads and I think handing this to their child their young girl or their young boy would be an incredibly empowering thing and maybe saying hey read the chapter on page 87 it's about um, managing your dad or your carer if you don't have you know, often it's assumed that it's the mum that a young girl will talk to, but maybe they can't talk to their mum, don't want to talk to their mum. So actually, I really loved that chapter. What do my little post-it notes say? Um, okay, it's got a nice little introduction, a start here. The contents are really great. It gives you a really good overview of what's going to be covered in the book, and you can flick to whatever you need to flick to. So it might um, be that you've literally, like, had this book on your shelf, and you have not got, um, you have not wanted to read it until you've actually got your period. You've woken up and there it is. Well, surprise, it's here. Dealing with your first period, page 26. Like, that's just so helpful. It's such a great contents page. And as a librarian, I super duper like a nice contents page. They're, they're how we navigate a book effectively. Um, I really like the representations of um, diverse women. Here's a um, young woman in a wheelchair and she talks about the challenges that women in wheelchairs face with their period and I also love that the women pictured in the book um, often have hairy legs as I do right now um, and they're women of all shapes and sizes so I really do and skin types and I love the representations of diversity the illustrator has done a great job um, there's a bit in the back about having a period boss and taking a period boss pledge and a period boss um, a period boss tries to always have extra pads, tampons in their period pack and is willing to give them to a fellow boss in need. A period boss will dutifully perform a pants check for leaks if asked, even if asked by a total stranger. Um, so it also deals with period challenges like um, what do you do if you have to go swimming when you have your period or you have sport or you have sleepovers? Um, and it talks about all of the options that are available to young girls these days who have their period. Um, no longer is it just um, pads and tampons. There is so many options out there. Now, I know of uh, one friend who has had their young boy read this book as well and I think that is 
freaking fabulous because boys need to understand what a period is about as much as girl, maybe not as much, but they need to understand what a period is about. Now, I am saying that this book is for um, your tween, but you need to be the judge of when they are ready to uh, read this book. I myself have a, um, a number of books in Woodster's room that are just on her shelf that she can read about puberty and being a female or just being a tween in this day and age. And she doesn't necessarily pick them up all the time, but I have definitely seen her reading them on occasion. And I always um, ask her if she wants to talk to me about them. At this stage, she doesn't because she's like a total eye roller, like, Ugh. But I'm actually not particularly concerned about her because she's been all over this um, because of that fabulous book, The Amazing True Stories of How Babies Are Made. She read that well and truly before I intended her to and has been explaining um, how IVF works to some of her uh, younger friends for quite some time now. So she is all over it and uh, is totes sorted with her period pack. I was going to say something else. Ah, so you need to be the judge of when your child is ready for this book. I will um, make you aware that there is a chapter on periods and sex and if you can have sex when you have your period and um, the implications or not of that. So if uh, that is something that might be slightly ah, to you, um, you do need to be aware of that. It is really age appropriate and is fairly briefly touched on, um, but, you know, Woodster's 11 and has this book and, you know, presumably at that age, most of you have already read books like The Amazing True Story of How Babies Are Made. So I love this book and I didn't talk, I didn't even look at my post-it notes on that one. Mm. Anyway, um, trying to get more organised with my Five on Friday and have actual interesting things to say about the books as opposed to me just chatting for um, a really long time. Okay, I'm going to go. This is ridiculously long. But I felt it was a really important thing to do, to talk about um, Do It In An Address, the One Girl campaign, and to also talk about um, books about girls. Okay, have a great weekend.